Okay. Let me begin by picking up on something Tomas said, that cities have always been places of sanctuary for thousands of years. The city is the invention of people who were thrown out of some other place and had to find a new place and did it together. But I want to add that the reasons the people were thrown out of a place was because most of the time of fundamental revolutionary transformations, sometimes revolutions in a short period of time, sometimes revolutions that took centuries. European cities were created in large part uh, by the collapse of feudalism over time and the movement of masses of serfs off of the countryside. And we have that today because capitalism's behavior outside of Europe, in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, has taken forms that have produced economic transformations in those parts of the world, resulting in people having to leave large parts of the countryside and come to a city. And as he pointed out, it could be a city in the same country that experiences these transformations, or they could come sooner or later to other cities. And that's really what's going on. I like this notion of the underlying revolution because I may be able to shed some light on the New York situation and in the United States. In New York City, we have a movement called Right to the City. It's associated with the geographer David Harvey that some of you know. But the Right to the City movement is not only to give a right to the city of the poor who come into New York, particularly these years from Central and Latin America, but it's very important to understand that the right to the city is also a right for the ability of millions of people to stay in the city because they are being driven out. What we call gentrification, and I understand you use that word in German too, gentrification in the United States is a very serious problem. It is forcing millions of people out of major cities. The best examples are New York, San Francisco, Detroit, but many others. And the right to the city is therefore not only for the sanctuary of the people coming in, but it's also a question of giving the right to people who have been there, in some case, for generations, not to have to leave. Mostly the effort to save them from having to leave have failed. And they have, in fact, left. And they are leaving. And that process is a profound support for Donald Trump because he speaks to them, those who have been forced out and those who are at risk of being forced out. So it's extremely important uh, to understand. And I would like to stress that this is a process in the United States that has mostly to do with capitalism. Let me give you the most extreme example. That is the city of Detroit. In 1970, 75, this was the key example of capitalist success in the United States. Presidents would bring leaders from other countries, and they would go on a trip from Washington to Detroit. Detroit was a city in 1970 of two million people. To give you an idea, it is today a city of 700,000 people. The exact opposite of the statistics Tomas gave you before. It is an empty city. It is a city you can drive through for hours seeing nothing but burnt, destroyed houses, empty stores, uh, parking lots with weeds growing through the asphalt that lines the park. What happened there? No mystery at all. Three automobile companies, General Motors, Ford, Chrysler, made the decision to make automobiles 
by hiring workers at lower wages. And those workers were in other parts of the United States than they were in Mexico and Canada, and now they are in China and India. And the result was no jobs, no jobs, because that was the industry, automobiles. In 1970, wonderful jobs, the best jobs in the United States, high wages, the strongest trade union called the United Auto Workers. So successful was it that black people, who I'm gonna to come to in a minute, who had come north from the south, were able to get better jobs in Detroit, working in the auto industry, than anywhere else. They were allowed into the union at a time when other unions didn't do that. And they had good jobs, so you had a black middle class, as we called it. So it was a place of integration. So successful was it that it was a cultural mecca too. I assume you know that much of the music you enjoy is now shaped in, and has been for 40 years by music developed in Detroit. It's called the Motown sound that some of you I'm sure know, which is a, a, a development of black music from the South brought to the urban area, intermingling with other music. It was very powerful. That city is now a complete disaster. It is formally bankrupt. It is the largest bankruptcy by a municipality in the history of the United States. But it is repeated everywhere. I was born in the city of Youngstown, Ohio. Same disaster. Camden, New Jersey. Cleveland, Ohio. One after the other. So the, the capitalism not only brings poor people in as it destroys around the world, it also pushes people out of the city when it's convenient to do so. What do I mean? Convenient because it's cheaper to produce cars in China and India than it is. That was a decision made by the board of directors of three companies. Those people, 15 for General Motors, 18 for Ford, and I think 16 for Chrysler. That's 45 people, roughly, made a decision that drove 1.3 million members of the city of Detroit out of the city. Many of them going to another city where five years later, the same thing happened to them. And the churches didn't do much and the city of Detroit didn't do much, and the governor of Michigan didn't do much, and the president didn't do much. None of them did, not the Republicans, not the Democrats, not the white ones, not Mr. Obama. Detroit went bankrupt under Obama, and he didn't do anything. Uh, Detroit is a black city. It made no difference at all. I know Mr. Obama was popular here in, the, in Europe. A mystery to us in the United States, from the beginning, a complete mystery. And part of what I have to say about Mr. Trump is to make sure that the reverse mystery doesn't happen again. Okay, what then is Mr. Trump about? Mr. Trump is a president who has to manage the transformation of capitalism. And that transformation has three key parts. One, moving production out of the United States now that jet tra transportation and the internet make it possible to supervise workers in Shanghai as easily as you can supervise them in New Jersey. There is no need to pay high American wages and they have no intention of doing it. So they left. Millions of jobs are gone. Central proposal, central platform of Donald Trump. This loss of jobs. Number two, cheapen wages in the second way, by bringing poor people in, which Mr. Trump also screams against. Number three, if capitalists cannot move to production where the labor is cheap and they can't bring cheap labor here, there's one mechanism left, and that's called automation. Substituting 
computers and robots for human beings, and we are very busy doing that with the jobs that are left. And that means the mass of people, to use a technical term, are screwed. That was a joke, an English language joke. There is no way out. My colleagues in economics like to tell you that if automation destroys jobs, it also creates them. This is, of course, true. But if you ever study calculus, you know everything depends on the flow in one direction versus the flow in the other direction. If the re reduction of jobs exceeds the creation of jobs, you have modern United States. And the businesses in America have no intention of stopping leaving, which they continue to do, stopping relying on cheap immigrants, which they continue to do, and stopping the investment in robotization and computers, which they continue to do. So you've got a problem of an immense excess population from the standpoint of capitalism. But it makes enormous profits for the top 5 or 10%. Remember, they're the ones who own the businesses who now pay low wages, much lower than they did before, who now own the enterprises that are using robots and, and computers. So the top 5 or 10% have become wildly wealthy, like 100 years ago. And they want to live in New York City and San Francisco and Get the picture? So those cities have to be transformed. They need two things. One, the middle class, the working class, who used to work in all these businesses, have to get out. Why? Because they need the space. They need to be, build beautiful apartment buildings with restaurants and indoor forests and all the rest. I'm serious. You come to New York. I will be glad to show you. We have indoor forests. Haben Sie das auch hier? Gut. Dann wissen Sie schon diese ganze Geschichte. So they have to throw people out. But at the same time, they have to bring people in. What they're throwing out is the educated, well-paid, white worker. And what they bring in is an army of unwhite, uneducated immigrants to be servants in all of these luxury apartments and fancy restaurants. So they need to reorganize this society, get one population out and a new one in. That's the reality. And Mr. Trump plays on that reality because it terrifies the older mostly white working class, because for them in this story, there is no place. There's nothing there. And for their children, even less. These are the children who in the last 40 years could finally go to college, which most Americans couldn't do before the 1960s. They finally got to college, they get a college degree, they're looking for the job that was promised to them Nada, nothing. There's nothing for them. Unless they are willing to become servants of the rich, which many of them are doing. If you want to work in a Starbucks coffee shop in New York City, you need a bachelor's degree from college. <laughs> Turns out, to make coffee requires four years of a college education. But you get paid what a barista gets paid, which is nothing. And they have to learn this. And those people are very, very angry. And they don't want to hear from another conventional Republican. And they don't want to hear from another conventional Democrat. They've been there. They've done that for the last 40 years of this process. and. They have it bis here. They möchten das nicht mehr haben. And they want somebody else. And Mr. Trump is somebody else. He's angry. He's bitter. He screams about these poor people that are taking their jobs. The white people don't want the jobs that those poor people are getting. It's crazy. 
but they feel the anger. They feel, and they want someone, and that's who he is. But please make no mistake. Mr. Trump became the president because he spoke to the transformation of this country, of the United States. And none of the others did. The closest was Sanders. And had there been a chance, had he not been destroyed by the Democratic Party, the Clinton family leading the way, who knows what he might have done. He had the only chance. Mrs. Clinton had no chance at all. Very important that you understand that. It's also important that you understand that Mr. Trump has the enthusiastic support of the entire banking community of New York City. You may read in the newspapers about people being critical of him, and there are, but the business community at the top cheering him on and financing him. They have no pro they want the transformations that they've been financing for 40 years. And if it takes a fascistic direction, tant pis, the French would say. What's the problem? We'll fix it. Mr. Trump is the extreme right-wing solution to these kinds of problems. He will not do much to stop immigration because there's no need to do that. This is a political theater. So we will deport five, 10 million, and another five or 10 million will come in. This theater can be reproduced. The only danger for Mr. Trump is he can't appear to be letting it go. But otherwise, there's no change here. Now the role of racism quickly. Racism in America is a problem of migration in sanctuary cities. It's the same problem. Black people come to the United States as slaves in the South. That's why they came, that's how they came. We had a civil war back in the middle of the 19th century and slavery was the way that the North defeated the South. Mr. Lincoln declared the slaves free. <laughs> this took from white Southerners the major property they owned. It was a revolution that took away the property of one class of people, slave owners. You do know that the compensation they got was nothing. And that makes the white people of the South hostile, which shouldn't come as a large surprise because they, their wealth was taken from them. Shortly thereafter, the question becomes, what happens to the white workers who weren't slave owners, there were plenty of those, when they were surrounded by black people who had a larger number and who were now like them, workers. This was a terrible problem because it might mean, it might mean that white and black would become allies since they were in the same situation. And if you know our history from around 1870 to around 1890, that was going on. There were many organizations very successful in the United States with black and white together that threatened the ruling capitalist class because you had destroyed the slave class, slave masters. And so a program which we call Jim Crow, a program in which it was developed to teach white, poor working class people in, in the South that yes, you didn't have much property. Yes, you fought the Civil War and were killed. And yes, after the war was over, you didn't get much, but there is something important you have. You are white. And that means you are at least better than those people right next door to you who aren't white. And to drive this home, there was a program of oppression and lynching. I assume you all know these stories. And part of that process was then to drive black people out of the South in large numbers. That wouldn't have been enough, but it was in the idea of capitalists in the North, wait a minute, we can work something out. They are taking the black people and pushing them out of the South, we will bring them here. That's how Detroit becomes a black city. 
There's an enormous migration of blacks from the South, starting at the end of the 19th century, right up into the 1930s and 40s. First, they were driven by racist uh, hostility, and then they were driven by the Great Depression, which affected them after 1929, and they came north where they could get work, and they became what you are dealing with now, a mass in migration to northern cities of black people from the south, where they had been agricultural workers, where they had not had public education, where they had lived in very poor conditions, and they were now crammed into urban ghettos, urban slums. So where all this begins from. So our problem was racism drove them, first of all, they were brought as slaves, then you had the Civil War, then racism drove them to the north, and then northerners became racists as they were crowded into an urban city. Throughout this time, though, notice, black people serve a function in our society. They are that which white people are better than. So no matter what happens to you, there's always somebody, first in the South, but now also in the North, who doesn't have a good job, who doesn't live in a nice neighborhood, who doesn't have adequate housing. And I tell you this only because you shouldn't believe that this problem will, will go away, that, that immigrants are absorbed, that the system, ha it doesn't, it can make them a perpetual underclass with horrible conditions. You should understand that because that's what we are in the United States. We are constantly confronted with black people who have become the priority choice to absorb the horrors of capitalism. They went out of the South slavery, then out of the Jim Crow, and finally got jobs in urban areas from which the current capitalism is ejecting them. Again, they are what we call in America shock absorbers. The black, you know that, that part of the automobile, the shock absorber. Capitalism's twists and turns keep coming and happening to them. Out of the 1.3 million people who were forced out of Detroit, the majority were black. Since 2008, we had a crash in world capitalism led by the housing industry of the United States, the subprime mortgages. I, I'm assuming you read about that. What group in our society has been most economically damaged since 2008? Answer, black people whose only wealth, they have no liquid wealth, they have no stocks, no bonds, nothing. They have a house and a car. Housing collapsed. Mr. Obama was president over the biggest loss of wealth by the African American community in the history of the United States. What they had finally accumulated, the little house, was now taken from them too. Which is why it has become so urgently necessary in the miserable ghettos to which they are still consigned with terrible job prospects to put the last step of controlling them, which is the police who kill them, and you read about it every couple of weeks, one more horrible instance than another. This is all about sanctuary cities, because that's what Detroit was, and New York was, still is. But you've got to be very careful lest this sanctuary not become the, the, the hothouse in which a permanent class becomes fixed upon which the ups and downs of capitalism are worked out. Why am I telling you this? Well, because the problem isn't migration, in my humble opinion, which isn't humble. Um, the, <laughs> In America, we always have to say humble opinion. It is so fraudulent that some of us are now taken to saying, in my humble opinion, and then that addition, not so humble. Um, because the problem is, for us in the United States, now very clear. 
is capitalism. And our problem isn't migration or climate or stop. It's very clear what our problem is. A capitalist system that grew up in certain places, Europe, North America, Japan, put its factories and stores and offices and put it there where they grew, understandable, but they don't need to stay there anymore and they had to make accommodations over 200 years with their working classes and give them good wages. They don't have to do that anymore. They have places to go and people to bring in who don't require the high wages and they have no intention of paying them anymore. And they are very happy to become a tiny, super rich class. In the United States, which went further in promising that that wouldn't happen than any of your countries in Europe. So it is particularly painful in the United States to confront the mass of working people with a statement. You are going nowhere, you have no future, and your children's prospects are poorer still. Whoa, you don't think that makes people very angry, then you, you're strange. We are very angry in the United States. That's why you see the signs of it everywhere. Okay, so what, what do we do? I would like to make uh, an argument, which is to build from what was said yesterday about bottom-up perspectives, how to deal with immigrants bottom-up. I agree with that. But I would just like to take it another step. Bottom up, which can also be called, I don't know, democracy or something like this. <laughs> bottom up, bottom up, if it's going to work anywhere, has got to work everywhere. It can't be just with sanctuary. It can't be just with immigrants. It can stop. That's not going to work if you don't change the society so it is, in a general way, bottom up. Because otherwise, you're going to have the frustrations that previous speakers have spoken to you about. Trying to do something for the immigrant community when you haven't transformed the larger part of what you're trying to get them into, which has no intention of giving up the things they smell are about to be taken away from them. They're not going to do that sooner by helping the others. They're not going to do it. So for us in the United States, we kind of take our example and we say, if you're going to say that people have a right to a city as a citizen, as a democratic participant, as a human being, then you have to begin to make that a national social project of which giving this to the immigrant is simply a part. That's why we link what we do for immigrants and for our cities with the transformation of the production system. That too has to be bottom up. And for us, that means the democratization of the workplace. You have to say, if everyone has a right to the city, then everyone has a right to a secure job in an enterprise over which they exercise a citizen's control. One person, one vote to decide what goes on at the workplace. Because whether you're an immigrant or not, that's where you spend most of your adult life. Five out of seven days, you're at the workplace. If democracy is going to be anywhere in the society, it has to be there. Because that's where you are most of the time. And for us, last point, by demanding the transformation of the workplace, we are speaking not just to the African American, not just to the immigrant, but we're speaking to all of those others who typically think that the left isn't interested in them and who therefore look for their friends on the right, who at least can put on a theater of such interest, even if it is as phony as Mr. Trump's, which is extraordinarily phony. It means we can talk to them because the project is for them too, because given the prospects they know they have, a transformation is an attractive proposition. Now my closing. You might be surprised. I don't actually know what the results of the election were in England when I went to sleep, but my understanding is Mr. Corbyn did better than he was expected to do and Mrs. May more poorly than she was expected. I'm not surprised. 
I'm not surprised, any more than I was surprised by Mr. Sanders. But what the Labor Party has done is gone further than anybody in what I'm talking about, and so I want to end by telling you what they've done. The Labor Party, particularly John O'Donnell, who does this work for the Labor Party, has a commitment that the Labor Party has made. If they win any election in the near future, they're going to pass two laws. The first law is going to say that for every business that exists in England today, in Great Britain, it can continue to function the way it is. But if it decides to close, or if it decides to move to China or someplace else, or if it decides to sell itself to another company, or if it decides to go public, to issue shares and become a stock company, the law will require it to do what's called giving the right of first refusal to its own workers to buy the enterprise and convert it into a worker co-op run democratically. The first country that I know of to do this. And then if you're wondering, like my audiences are in the United States, that this is a very nice law, but where they're going to get the money, the workers, to do it, then Mr. O'Donnell smiles, much as I'm smiling now, and says the second part of the law is that the British government will lend them the money. <laughs> that is a polite way for us today to do what the capitalists did to the slave owners in the American Civil War. You're beginning to take from them the property upon which they have run these societies we live in and now run them into unsustainable places. The urgency of this is not only because it's possible and it's a political strategy, it's the only strategy we can find on the left in the United States at a moment when the left is resurging in America in a way none of us expected to see in our lifetimes. And we're all caught up in it, and I hope I'm conveying to you not just the details of what I'm saying, but a certain tone and a certain elan, which we have now. But this is the best time in American history to be a Marxist. Thank you.